Hello and welcome to our event, Growing Greener, Shaping the Future of ELM and Nature Recovery. Thank you for taking the time to join us for the first of two events. I'm Stuart Oates and we've got a great selection of speakers for you. And while you'd normally be crammed into a hall somewhere, for most of a day, we've condensed everything you need to know down into just about an hour. Our team is monitoring the comments section below, so please do ask any of your burning questions throughout, or you can get in touch on Twitter at Cornwall AONB. We're very honoured to have Robin Teverson to welcome you all and get us underway. Lord Teverson has been at the sharp end of politics for much of his career, working as an MEP in Europe and becoming a peer in 2006. Robin has a strong interest in the environment as chair of the Cornwall and Isles of Scilly Nature Partnership, but he also has a wider understanding of the global challenges we're facing, having chaired a select committee in the House of Lords on the Arctic and the changes we're seeing. Robin will also be chairing our second event, the Growing Greener Workshop, on the 4th of March. Details of how to sign up to that and all of the organisations featured here today can be found in the description below. Good evening, I'm Robin Teverson, I chair Cornwall and Isles of City Local Nature Partnership and I'm really pleased to launch this series of two webinars around growing greener. There's a huge amount that's been going on recently in terms of legislation around farming and around the environment. The agricultural bill that completely changes the way that uh, finance for farmers works, getting rid of the basic payment system and at the moment going through Parliament is the Environment Bill that introduces a number of things obviously around the environment but one of them is called uh, Nature Recovery Networks and I'll come on to that later because Cornwall is way ahead on that in comparison with many other parts of, of the country. And I think one of the things to remember is that uh, there really is a nature crisis uh, in not just uh, Cornwall but the UK worldwide we have biodiversity loss and we have the loss of the just the quantum of, of, of nature in our not just in our countryside but uh, throughout uh, our urban areas as, as well so let me we're going to look uh, when we really want your reactions uh, during uh, this uh, this series because we need to work out how we move this agenda forward and let me just talk about a couple of areas first is that agricultural area of the environmental land management scheme that I'm sure all of you have heard about now. But the, prop, the issue is that it changes the way that finance works completely. So it's now public money for public goods and that's all around getting environmental gain in agriculture for payments. And uh, there's all sorts of uh, ways that that is, three basic ways it can deal with landscape level, nature recovery level or at single farm level and it's really important that uh, farmers in Cornwall get access uh, to this as the scheme rolls out over the next seven years. Sounds a long time but it will uh, soon arise and we see that uh, certainly in the local nature partnership in the AOOBs, uh, all those areas as a major way that we can improve nature in uh, Cornwall but at the same time keep farms financially viable which is really important as well. And then we have the Environment Bill bringing this nature recovery networks. Now this is all around uh, planning out, if you like, how nature can improve in, uh, in, in, uh, in the local area, usually by a local authority, in our case uh, Cornwall obviously, and with maps, with uh, plans of, how, of action of how we actually get that uh, much better biodiversity and uh, reverse that retreat in, in, in nature. And in Cornwall we have a pilot scheme which is going on at the moment uh, with uh, four other regions in uh, England, it's an English scheme and what we want to make sure is that those plans for nature recovery tie up also with the agricultural plans for making sure that farms are viable both in terms of nature and in terms of, of finance and bringing those together are really really important and farming which takes up some three quarters of uh, Cornwall's land mass is the way actually to achieve that. So what we want to do in these uh, two sessions, uh, the next one next week is, is, is a workshop, interactive, is to hear back from all of you about how we achieve that because what's really important is that we actually manage to make this transition and this big change successful. 
Why do we need it? We need it because of soil health. We need it around capturing carbon. We need it around our pollinators and all the other areas that will make our farms and our land environmentally good quality, but at the same time, making sure that uh, farming is profitable at the same time as well. I hope you enjoyed this session. Please um, join in and uh, give us feedback and be part of the net workshop next week. Now, Carolyn Cadman is Deputy Chair of Cornwall LNP, as well as the Chief Executive of Cornwall Wildlife Trust. She shared some of the Trust's strategic vision for the future of wildlife protection in the duchy. Cornwall has some amazing landscapes, which is why so much of it is designated as an area of outstanding natural beauty. But sadly, wildlife and nature is under pressure here just as much as it is in other parts of the country and around the world. Around 10 years ago, Professor Lawton published a report called Making Space for Nature, where he called for bigger, better, more joined up spaces for nature. And in 2018, DEFRA um, published the DEFRA 25 Year Environment Plan, which called for the creation of a national nature recovery network and set the framework for the new environmental land management schemes, which you'll be hearing more about this evening. In Cornwall, the Cornwall Council and supported by the Local Nature Partnership have set a target um, for 30% of land and seas to be managed for nature's recovery by 2030, something which Cornwall Wildlife Trust supports. And you can see on the banner behind me that we want more land, rivers and seas managed well for wildlife too. And that's what we're working towards. But depending on whose statistics you follow, around 75% of Cornwall is owned and managed by the private sector, by farmers and landowners. So there's no way that that 30% um, target could be achieved without working in partnership and collaboration with farmers and landowners. Now, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, the West Country Rivers Trust have been working on a programme called Upstream Thinking for some years now. Um, that's funded by South West Water and it's, it's working with farmers to look at ways in which they can um, farm differently to benefit water quality and to be benefit wildlife. And here's a short video telling you all about it. So the Upstream Thinking Project was an idea put forward by Southwest Water to work with landowners in the catchments where they draw drinking water to try and reduce the amount of diffuse pollution that goes into watercourses. And today we are at Triskyba, which is a farm at the northern end of the Cobra catchment. The area that you are always concerned about is runoff because we do tend to have a lot of rain in the winter. So you don't want to be putting fertilizers on a field that end up in the river because you've wasted your money and it's not good for the river. Once you're comfortable that someone is actually trying to help you, the working relationship then really does grow. So it's then that hopefully you come out with a result that is good for everyone. The soil management probably side of things has been the most interesting. We've had a great tradition of using compound fertilizers, trying to keep a balance in the soil. So Stuart kindly came along, did some tests. I did some soil testing back in December 2016. We take samples of a chosen field. That gives you an average of the field's condition. That sample is then boxed and it's sent away with other samples across the farm, we would then interpret those results and make recommendations. The, the soils were quite out of kilter, that they were too high in phosphates, phosphates move with soil. And if the soil gets into the water, of course the phosphate goes with it. And that's not a good thing. Not just for the drinking water, but also for the ecology of the water course, because it can cause problems for all the little invertebrates and also for spawning brown trout, which need clean water and clean gravel and ultimately at the far end of the cobra it will end up in low pool which is a triple si this can lead to algal blooms and in particular blue green algae which is toxic we needed to get those phosphates which are excessive down we were buying compounds we didn't need and we replaced that with buying in some lime products we brought our ph levels up to six and have increased our crop yields and the soil structure is better for it so you're spending the same time, same money, but actually producing more and of better quality. 
We've reduced the amount of phosphate that's available to be washed away, which is reducing the risk of nutrients going into the watercourse and ultimately down to low pool and the sea. There's always a wildlife potential on a farm. Farms are now have got limited opportunities for, for wildlife. It doesn't have to be that way. I think we can get the farmland to work more efficiently and there can still be corners where there are opportunities for the wildlife and I think you can have both. Any small change, any small positive change on a farm is worth, worth our time. I am hopeful for the future in terms of us turning a corner and actually rebuilding a landscape. I think it's very important that all farmers uh, have to realise that we are part of the environment, we've got to look after it. Next up we've got Becky Hughes who's the Project Development Officer for the Environmental Growth Team at Cornwall Council. Becky is working on the local nature recovery pilot and has a background in farm advice. We are creating a new website aimed at farmers, landowners and land managers in Cornwall, which will be a space where we can all share, access and understand data and information relating to our natural environment in Cornwall. There's an awful lot of projects going on and funding opportunities that arise and planning that needs to be done for the future if we're going to achieve our public goods objectives. And at the moment we don't have a collaborative space where we can easily access and understand and share everything that's happening. That's what we want the Land Hub to be. By visiting the Land Hub website, you will not just be able to view data that's relevant to your farm, like local surface water flooding issues, or where nature recovery networks are building, or where there is funding opportunities for tree planting. You'll also be able to look at soil health data and you'll also be able to find out who in your local area is doing similar nature conservation work to you and where you might be able to start forming groups and clusters of people who can work together. We understand that there's a gap at the moment between farmers and advisors and the stakeholder agencies such as Cornwall Council and the Environment Agency who are working and we want the Land Hub to be a space where we can all come together and share information and collaborate. So, as well as a data portal and a map viewer, we want LandHub to become a platform where we can monitor and record work that is being delivered for the natural environment and where we can start to see how we are achieving nature recovery and climate resilience on the ground. It'll be a place where we can, where we can monitor what tree planting targets have been achieved, where we can look at water quality improvements that are being made, where we can start to map and monitor how regenerative farming and high nature value farming is changing our landscape around us. We need to be able to gather data together to share it and to see how we're progressing so that we know what else needs to be done in the future. It's really important that we've got a tool that works for us at the Cornwall, at the Cornwall scale, not just so that we can see what's happening in our natural environment, but so that we can understand how funding can best be used to achieve all of our objectives. We know that this isn't going to happen all at once. The Land Hub is going to be a tool that grows in stages and this first stage, hopefully launched in the summer, will be a test of whether we can actually produce something that works and is accessible for you as farmers. But we hope that you will really get involved and that you will help us with user testing and stakeholder consultation and that you will be there and supporting Land Hub as it grows. It's being built by local company Vitamin Cornwall and we'll be carrying out consultation and giving out project updates between now and the planned launch this summer. So do keep in touch with us. Now there are six ELM test and trials that are taking place or have finished across Cornwall. We've spoken to three of those who are at varying stages of completion. The consultants and farmers involved have recorded an overview of the findings and their experiences, how well it worked and the challenges. We spoke with the group on the Lizard, North Cornwall and at Upstream Thinking. Firstly, we go to The Lizard, where Colette Beckham has been leading the project. Hello everybody, my name's Colette Beckham. Uh, I'm from Gain Consulting and I've been helping the Cornwall AONB with their Environmental Land Management Scheme trial on The Lizard. Uh, the main aims of the trial are to develop a landscape scale framework to govern 
an ELM scheme within a protected landscape uh, to understand how the delivery of that framework translates onto a farm scale and how that impacts on the farm business. Uh, understand how you would bring together a collaborative group of farmers and work best with them to produce something like that. And then also to understand the ecosystem services value of delivering the framework. So some results, we've been working with the spatial data with our farming group. We wanted to understand whether landscape character assessment could perform as a spatial framework for setting natural capital objectives. And we found that it did provide a really good spatial scale against which to set our objectives. Um, we had a look at also at some lay gas derived opportunities maps for ecosystem services from the University of Exeter. Um, we wanted to see how our farmers would become more familiar with this mapping with good facilitation as time went on. And we found that they became more comfortable and more comfortable using the mapping as we progressed through our workshops. We worked with our farmer group to establish priority objectives and targets. So we had Cornish hedges, wetland and freshwater, farmland, woodland, agroforestry, heathland, organic, heritage and education. And our farmers were able to work to produce some really impressive and ambitious targets for each of those objectives, uh, such as 20% increase in the area of freshwater and wetland in the project area and 80% of the rotational land, arable and improved pasture in um, more species rich, rich options by the end of the 10 year scheme. So whilst we were looking at our objectives, we did uh, explore the possibility of, of doing big scale land cover change with our farmers. And we um, found that there were many barriers to doing that, which was a key learning point from our trial. Um, big scale habitat creation and things like rewilding represents a significant proportion for these small farms of the land holding. Very often it's not economic for them to do that and there was a lot of scepticism as to whether Elms payments would be high enough to make doing something like that worthwhile. Um, farmers are much more happy to discuss changes to management of land in the rotation, so arable and improved pasture which was good because there's an opportunity there in that it's the greatest extent of natural capital type within our study area and many other areas as well. Uh, we worked with our farmer group to co-design our landscape framework. So we explored with our farmers what the content should be of our landscape recovery framework to um, help them the best to develop an ELM scheme, either an individual farm level ELM scheme or a collaborative farmers working with a, a group. So um, our landscape framework was produced in five parts, natural capital and landscape profiles, pressures and condition, opportunities, which had the spatial mapping uh, for ecosystem services in there, delivery, which set out our priority objecti objectives, sorry, and our targets, and uh, a land management section, which contained land management advice that related specifically to the priority objectives and targets and signposted effectively to other information that's out there in the wider world. As well, we wanted to understand what the, val the pounds and pence value was of achieving our framework over a, a, a possible 10 year uh, scheme period. So we looked at a rapid valuation study, uh, looking at five of our priority objectives out of the nine and we uh, assess their value for five ecosystem services over 10 years. And the ecosystem services we looked at were water quality, water regulation, wild species diversity, carbon sequestration, and carbon storage. And the big headline figure was that the net value, the, before and, the difference between before and after, if you like, of achieving our landscape framework on the lizard was between 3.7 million at a low estimate and 15.8 million at a high estimate. And um, we were impressed and encouraged by the results of our valuation study. So our trial hasn't finished yet. The next steps, um, we're due to finish in June. Our next steps are to translate the framework into three case study farms. 
Uh, so the University of Exeter are leading on this. Uh, they will be looking at opportunities on farm to deliver the framework. And they'll also be doing a bit of work on what kind of level of payment should we be looking at to make a scheme attractive and workable on farm. Um, Flag South West are a partner in our trial. They have planned a, a series of farmer engagement and training events up until the end of the trial in June. Obviously, this might be a little bit impacted by COVID and we're just keeping a watching brief on that at the moment. And then uh, at the end of this quarter, I should have produced hopefully a natural capital prospectus, which is another key output of our trial. And that's basically a natural capital investment plan to uh, take the framework and see how we can um, produce something that looks at how we could co-finance an ELMS scheme with public and private sector funding. Now, David Oates is an organic livestock farmer managing over a thousand acres. He's been taking part in the test and trial scheme on the lizard. We managed to catch up with him to find out how he felt it had gone and what he was hoping to get out of it. My name's David Oates. I'm a farmer on a Rizuric farm, which is my family farm. Um, on the Lizard Peninsula and I'm one of the farmers that's part of the test and trial group uh, for the Lizard Peninsula in South Cornwall. The priority for me is to ensure that the new subsidy scheme secures a future for a family farm such as myself so that I can run a viable business to pass on to the next generation um, in a way that protects what we've got and our environment without sacrificing uh, too much really. I'm quite positive with what we've got at the, well, so far. Um, I hope that DEFRA take on board what we've said and not too many points get lost. Um, but overall, I think it looks very positive. Uh, it's my hope that the new changes will be a bit more outcome driven so that when we have an inspection, say, people actually look at what you're doing overall as a whole picture and not too prescriptive on the single item. Um, which is already changing in the stewardship, you know, credit to DEFRA, they are doing that already, but I hope that Elms will take it to the next level. And I hope to see uh, a wider landscape change where farmers can work together more and um, be, be financially supported to do so. Now, Daniel Paul works with Upstream Thinking as a project manager. His test and trials project is a little different as he's been working for Cornwall Wildlife Trust, examining how ELM can work in the horticultural sector. This scheme is in the very early stages of delivery. Now, the trial came about because we've been working with landowners and farmers um, at the Trust for, uh, since the 60s. And certainly since um, in the last 10 to 15 years through the Upstream Thinking project, We've been working shoulder to shoulder with landowners and farmers um, over over 200 or so uh, to date. Um, and one thing that uh, seemed apparent to us the more we were working is that the horticultural sector um, were not getting the benefits and we're not getting involved with um, some of the agro environmental schemes. And we wanted to see if we could help um, find the barriers to that um, and bridge those gaps um, with the new ELM scheme. So. Our new ELM uh, test is called Making ELM Work for the Horticultural Sector and it focuses on the, the design of the new ELM uh, system and that it, should, um, <clears throat> that it should fit with the variable short-term rotations and, uh, and those complex rental agreements uh, that are an important and integral part of the vegetable and the flower growing um, industries across the UK and certainly here um, in our region. We're looking at historically why there has been a low uptake to agro-environmental schemes by the horticultural sector in the past. Um, and we were, we're looking at what the barriers are uh, to that engagement and how we can get uh, over them. So the test that we're running um, involves currently uh, over 15 horticultural businesses, um, 10 private uh, landowners and four landowning uh, uh, estates, all obviously involved with the horticultural sector. Um, and we began this test uh, back in December uh, last year in 2020. And over the past few months, we've been holding our initial barriers meetings. And we're currently in those early stages of one-to-one -one interviews um, with all the participants. 
early indicators, and obviously they are early at the moment, are that the horticultural sector um, in Cornwall are very keen to engage with Elm. Um, participants are also very interested and, um, and excited about the existing countryside stewardship uh, mid-tier options. Now that they've benefited uh, from, from some help and bespoke advice from our farm advisors, um, uh, and all of our farm advisors have got um, great working knowledge of the of the stewardship the countryside stewardship scheme. Um, so we're wondering um, it's pointing towards an issue of that there's a lack of agri environmental scheme knowledge um, within the the growing sector, um, and maybe that's because there's a lack of trusted advisors, um, and that's kind of emerging as one of the key barriers to the scheme entrance, rather than what I initially thought might be the case, which was it was simply just unsuitable uh, for the for the business type. Um, so within the interviews that we're holding, um, the interview structures are that we're encouraging the test participants to evaluate um, and suggest adaptions to mid tier options, as well as evaluating and adapting a few options that are proposed by Cornwall Wildlife Trust which focus on um, delivery of public goods. Um, participants will be asked and are being asked uh, to put forward their own options as well. And the design, um, which will help incentivize changes to rotations, um, to cultivations and other field scale horticultural practices. And all of that is in order to um, deliver public goods um, of air, climate, soil, water and wildlife. Um, but it all has to fit in with growing vegetables and flowers. Um, as part of our test, we're also exploring uh, the nature of land rental agreements in the short term letting sector, looking to see how Elm can be flexible enough um, to accommodate annual double cropping um, of vegetables and annual cropping licenses which in some cases can see a change of tenancy from uh, six to 12 months. And as I say, it's early days uh, in the trial um, in our Elm horticultural test, uh, but so far working, uh, the work is going really well and we're really delighted to see such an appetite for change from this sector. Um, there's clear interest in moving towards more sustainable land management practices driven by both morals and market and if elm can help to financially support this type of change to reduce the financial risks associated with trying out these new practices then we predict uh, the uptake from the sector um, should be high and the delivery of public goods on horticultural cropping around cornwall will see a significant improvement um, i was hoping to give this update to you from the field uh, it seemed nice and appropriate, but I'm sorry the wind is howling out there. Um, but the last thing I'd like to say is um, a massive thank you uh, to all those involved uh, with the project from the horticultural sector or involved with the sector. Um, it's been really nice um, having everyone rushing to, uh, to get involved with it. Um, and a big thanks uh, to Jan Dinsdale, who's our farm advisor, uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust farm advisor, who's out there at the moment um, in a windy field somewhere. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more, then please drop onto the Cornwall Wildlife Trust um, website, uh, where you can uh, look up the ELM trials and what we do with farmers um, and the Upstream Thinking Project. Next up, we've got Laurie Sampson, who's the Assistant Farm Conservation Advisor for FWAG Southwest based in Cornwall. Laurie's worked as a facilitator for both the Lizard Testing Trials and North Cornwall. He's speaking to us today about the North Cornwall Group. Hi there, my name is Laurie Sampson and I work for the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group South West. Uh, I'm based in Cornwall and I was lucky enough recently to be involved in a ELM test and trial project based on the north coast of Cornwall uh, with a group of around 20 farmers uh, between uh, Perrinporth and Bude. And um, so my job in this project was to, to get this group of farmers together, get them sat, sat around a table um, and really thrashing out ideas for how ELM could support a project looking at farmer led nature recovery networks, 
where an interconnected network of habitats um, would, would strengthen uh, and increase wildlife populations. Um, so this was a really invaluable experience um, for myself as, as an advisor, as a farm advisor, just to, just to have this much time to listen uh, to farmers and really glean their ideas um, and, and understand how they, how they feel about this particular issue. Um, and I think it was a really invaluable experience for them as well um, to be able to have these conversations with their neighbours that they perhaps often don't have that opportunity uh, to do. Um, and, and, and I think they enjoyed it a lot and got a lot out of it. They, they, they were returning every session um, to continue those really flowing conversations. Um, so there were some really, really important and strong messages coming out quite unanimously from this group particularly around, you know, in general, just the importance of how, how, how effective ELM needs to be. And these, these farmers are absolutely, you know, they, they spend a lot of time and a lot of effort engaging with agri-environment schemes, um, and they really want to see them working well for nature. So it's really important that they, that they work well. More, more specifically, they were particularly interested in developing, um, you know, agreements that would, that would allow them to be quite flexible, um, so, so actually, and to be able to adapt their their agreements um, as they go forward, to to improve them and increase effectiveness um, to to whatever it is they're targeting. So that might be moving um, moving a particular area that they're managing or, or changing how they manage it because you know the the surveys are showing that it isn't working quite so well, and that that's another point actually as well, that they're really keen to be able to connect with wildlife surveyors. And we have a great community in Cornwall of volunteer wildlife surveyors um, who would be delighted to, to access some of this private land and, um, and, and, and just collect some of this data. And the farmers are really, really keen to, to engage with that type of, um, that type of process where where they will you know have that information to understand if what they're doing is working well for wildlife and if it's not then to be able to adjust it so that it's it's being more effective and they're actually you know making a better use of this opportunity to help wildlife on on the land that they very often feel a great responsibility to to look after not only for produ producing quality food and um, but also for nature um they're also really keen to, to to get across the point that they know often where the best places are for creating habitats on the farm. They know where their unproductive ground is, where the, the wetter ground is, and, and the, the places that could be set aside or, or managed specifically for wildlife while having a minimum impact on, on production of food. Um, so yeah, anyway, this is a, a, a really interesting process, really valuable, um, and I think these testing trials um, are, are a really important thing to engage with, um, and, and, and the way of just talking to people on the ground to understand these issues. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased with the project, and um, I, I think it was a great experience. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Charlie Watson Smythe farms in Padstow, and he's been working with Laurie on the North Cornwall test and trials in his area. Uh, my name is Charlie Watson Smythe uh, and I farm just over 1200 acres with my wife and two sons. Uh, we run a, a very diverse enterprise. We have cattle, sheep and pigs. Uh, all the livestock is go through our farm shop uh, and we grow approximately 500 acres of barley as well. <coughs> when we took on one farm, the Lizic, which is up on Stepper Point on the headland, uh, it's when the very first stewardship scheme was introduced uh, and I was approached with a view to, to joining the scheme and it seemed to fit our purposes very well. Uh, it enabled us to run sheep and cattle up there and look after the environment at the same time. I've been involved in stewardship since it first started which uh, I think is almost 30 years ago. So that's aging me a bit. Um, the positives are, I do think we are contributing to the environment and to wildlife. Um, we had a man out here three or four years ago uh, doing an inspection for DEFRA. Uh, and he came to see me afterwards and he said, um, I'm not very good on wildlife, he said, but I've been the whole way around this farm, he said, and I've never been on a farm in all my life 
and seen so much wildlife. He said, don't ask me what I've seen, because I couldn't tell you the difference between a moth and a butterfly. But he said, I've seen an awful lot of it. And that gave me a great deal of satisfaction. I think one of the difficulties that DEFRA have always had is getting enough advisors on the ground. Uh, we get, we sign up to a scheme. The original schemes were very flexible. You had an advisor you could speak to and if you felt something wasn't working properly, um, the advisor was happy to say, okay, we'll change that. We'll try doing something different. Now, schemes are very prescriptive and they tell you exactly what you can do. So two years, three years down the road, you might feel it's not working as well as it could work, but you can't change that because you don't have an advisor that, that knows the area well. Um, and you think, this is madness. I'm getting paid to do something I know is not working properly and I don't know how to get out of that. We're all, we're all looking at the same end, which is improving the environment, trying to be good for wildlife uh, and, and also encouraging people to appreciate that. I think as farmers, if we're going to accept public money, we have to allow public scrutiny. And one of the things we've always done here is to allow public access. We've opened up permissive paths for people to walk around the farm and be able to see things. And as ever, most of the world is very appreciative of that and they enjoy the opportunity to see both the environment and see hopefully what we've achieved. The fields right up on the cliff edge, which are 200 foot high looking straight out over the Atlantic. It's pretty sparse ground up there. Uh, and to try and make a living purely agriculture, you've got to be as intensive as you possibly can, uh, which is not good for the environment. Whereas the stewardship payments enable me to pay my rent and farm in an environmentally friendly way at the same time as producing high quality food we can sell in our shop. When we've been to the Elms meetings, the crucial thing is to have good advice and for the schemes to be flexible. So you can change mid-flight. If something's not working satisfactorily or you feel it's not correct, you have an advisor who knows the area who can say, yeah, I agree with that. We'll change what we're doing and we'll try something different. I think that's really, really important. Now, moving on from DEFRA's ELM approach, we'll have three components for farmers to sign up to. The sustainable farming incentive, local nature recovery, and finally, landscape recovery. With ELM in such early stages and test and trials ongoing, I spoke with a farm commoners collaboration in the South Downs to see how longer term initiatives have developed and how that might look for Cornwall's farmers in the future. Anthony Weston is Director of Complete Land Management and a farm and environment consultant. Annie Brown is the lead farmer for Eastern South Downs Farmers Group. We are coming towards the end of our five year term as a Natural England uh, funded farmer cluster under the Facilitation Fund. Um, and uh, we set the group up um, as sort of one of the earlier ones, I guess, um, looking at some of the common issues in our eastern part of the South Downs National Park. Um, so we tried to pick out some common themes in terms of uh, farmland bird uh, recovery, uh, public access and public engagement was a big theme as well. Uh, as well as working with some other stakeholders on issues such as uh, soils and nutrient management as well. Okay, and so Annie, how have you found the process so far? Have you been get engaged right from the beginning? Yes, I have. So Anthony and I um, got together um, from sort of slightly different angles, but uh, we were both looking at doing the same thing. So um, uh, from fairly early on, we, we sort of worked as a team. And um, it's been, it has been quite a journey. It, it's not easy getting farmers to work together um, and finding the common threads. And I, there are every, we're, we're all mixed farms, different sizes, different priorities, um, different, even within our, our geographic area, there, there are some different pressures. Some are more hotspots for, for visitors and, and such like. So um, it has been difficult to find 
the areas to focus on. And I think probably we'd both agree that what we've ended up doing is perhaps not what um, the, the real drive at the beginning, which was more sort of landscape scale delivery on the ground. We found um, that an initial premise of the pharma clusters is, is knowledge exchange within the group. Um, and collaboration doesn't come naturally to, uh, to certainly our group of farmers and I think a lot, lots of groups of farmers. Um, there's a good element of healthy competition between farm businesses. They see each other as sometimes competitive uh, with each other. Um, whether that's on delivery of stewardship options or whether that's uh, on commodities or livestock, um, collaboration can be tricky sometimes. Um, and hence teasing out common themes and common issues and people discussing openly what's gone well and what hasn't gone so well. Um, and what we've actually found probably only fairly recently really has been that we've moved into more sort of project based approach, if you like. So picking up individual uh, projects that we can deliver with subsets of, of the group rather than trying to come up with themes across our whole patch. We've got about 45 farmers involved and we've got quite a, it's quite a linear patch. Um, it's one of the things we've agonized over and if we did it again, whether we would split that down and have a smaller size, um, you know, geographically. And not being beholden to the Natural England sort of, um, facilitation plan can be tricky for a five-year period as, as well. Things change and some things work and others don't and being able to sort of pick things up and drop them along the way uh, would be useful and is not always easy when you are uh, tasked with sort of following your plan that you agreed with Natural England at the outset. And where do you think your biggest successes have come then? And in, in fact, Annie, what in, in terms of your little part of the, the project of, on your farm, how have you found it so far? And what's, what, what's been the best bits? I think we're, we're the, the um, two or three specific projects um, have, uh, are in their infancy. And if those do, uh, come off that would be good but probably if you say what what have we achieved dealing with the water companies I think is one and it's uh, again that's um, southern water was um, is is at one end of the patch southeast water is at the other and and um, and we've only just in the last few weeks really sort of made a connection uh, with southeast water um, in terms of uh, getting a face for the farmer out into uh, and uh, sharing the story of what we're doing on the farm and, and I will often say it's not um, uh, people engagement is not part of our toolbox the farmers we get on with with farming we're not very good at telling people what we're doing and with the National Park we um, took part in a meet the farmer exercise which was uh, a series of interviews with farmers along the South Downs Way um, that actually uh, was was filmed and then a little plaque with a QR code that goes on um, uh, way markers on the South Downs Way and uh, that's been promoted and, and if one can build on that um, with Instagram and social media mm -hmm. and the story of farming and we, uh, I mean our particular farm did a have been doing some trials on um, uh, with uh, southern water and groundwater, nitrates in groundwater. Um, and that was picked up by the Farmers Weekly, so that, that was good um, recently. There's another member farmer who's um, really going for mob grazing. I, I admire him hugely. He loves doing electric fencing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he, and, and he's really trying to... Um, to, to do that and, and get into regenerative farming. So there are a few little um, ideas and, and what he's doing is shared among the others. And um, there's a little bit of competition and intrigue. And, and I think there will be three or four little threads. The, the other um, thing that has happened is uh, actually dealing, I mean, we've got a project going with uh, University of Sussex 
um, which again was, as Anthony said, as a group of farmers, um, one of the lecturers came to us and said, well, you know, we're doing a lot of projects in Africa. I'd love to do something on the doorstep. Mm -hmm. So that, again, it, it is a long burn because it's looking at grassland growth and patterns, but um, we wouldn't have got that were we not working together. Mm -hmm. In Cornwall, there are other organisations that can offer useful advice and on-farm information so that farmers and farm businesses can get ready for ELM and nature recovery. Up next, we hear from Forest for Cornwall, Pastures for Life and the CLOS LEP on what is available. Sean O'Hay is the Forest for Cornwall Senior Programme Officer. Hello, my name's Sean O'Hay. I'm from the Forest for Cornwall team and I'm here to talk to you today about the Forest for Cornwall and how we can help you as landowners and land managers to establish trees and woodlands on your land holding. The Forest for Cornwall is part of Cornwall Council's response to the climate and ecological emergencies and it sets the ambitious target of establishing at least 8,000 hectares of new woodland in Cornwall by the year 2030. Now, this is an ambitious target. We're going to have to work with a wide range of partners and landowners to achieve this and there are many forms this can take. So it could be a new large or small woodland on your farm, it could be a field corner, it could be mature trees in the hedgerows, it could be a new orchard for example, uh, it could be some form of agroforestry, a silver pasture project for example. Now these all come with different benefits potentially for your farm business, so it could provide a new income stream, it could provide shade or shelter for your livestock or crops, um, it can help uh, improve soil quality and prevent soil erosion, uh, it can prevent flash flooding lower down in the catchment by slowing the flow of water, um, and not least it can uh, provide huge environmental benefits and, and help to tackle the climate emergency and uh, it can bring more wildlife into your, into your farm and land holding. Forest for Cornwall can help you achieve your vision of what you'd like to achieve on your land. The first thing to do if you'd like to work with Forest for Cornwall would be to contact us for our website. So if you go onto any web browser and Google Forest for Cornwall you'll find a link and we'll provide a link at the end of this presentation as well. If Once you go onto the website there'll be a short form to fill in and then one of our team will contact you and then we can come out and do a, a visit to your land holding. We can listen to you and hear what you'd like to achieve and how you'd like it to fit with your farm business and we can help you to achieve those aims. We can help to shape them and we can provide advice on the right place to plant trees. Not everywhere is suitable for planting trees necessarily. Uh, we can provide advice on the right species to plant and critically we can provide advice on what funding is available. There is a lot of funding available for tree and woodland establishment at the moment and there's more coming online all the time. So for example, Cornwall, uh, the government are seeking to uh, deliver their 25 year environment plan uh, and we're in a post Brexit world, the government are working to establish the next round of agri-environment schemes, the ELM schemes. So our project officers will be um, up to date on the latest developments in this respect and we can provide you with the advice on which uh, funding stream might best suit your project. Once we've been to visit you, we'll summarise all this in a report and we'll provide some more information on uh, opportunities and constraints on your land. Uh, we'll look at the designations, if there's any, um, and how this may affect your planting project. And hopefully this will set you up to take your next steps into establishing trees and woodlands on your land. Now from woodland to grassland, Charlotte Wheeler is the Pastures for Life Regional Development Manager and will be speaking about how their regional offer may benefit farmers in the southwest. Hi everyone, I'm Charlotte. I work with the Pasture Fed Livestock Association. For those of you who don't know, the PFLA is a movement of farmers, butchers, retailers, academics, supporters and others dedicated to promoting the practice of feeding ruminants wholly from diverse pastures. We're a not-for-profit that provides support to farmers, helping them transition to pasture-based farming. 80% of our members are farmers themselves, and they range from conservation grazers in the highlands to high-intensity mob grazers in the lowlands, from small holdings to large commercial farms and estates and everything in between. So if you're not sure if moving away from grain suits your farm business, I encourage you to look into our standards and to join us as a member so you can access our forum and see the different routes that our farmers have taken to transition to pasture fed. We update our standards every two years, so we feel confident that we're on the cutting edge of environmental and animal health. Now, in terms of elms, obviously everything is quite speculative at this point, but based on the wide range of environmental and animal health benefits that can accompany 100% pasture-based farming, we feel confident that our standards will tie in quite closely. Even though it's not set in stone from looking at clauses 1 to 6 of the 2020 Agricultural Act, which describes public goods that might be eligible for assistance in the future, we can see a few obvious examples that tie in with what PFLA farmers are already doing today. D, for example, is managing land, water or livestock to mitigate or adapt to climate change. 
Pasture for life beef and sheep consume no grains or concentrates and ideally are raised with minimal inputs. This helps keep their carbon footprint lower than their grain fed counterparts. On top of this, healthy grassland and soils store carbon, so good grazing management can be one of the tools we use to mitigate climate change and get UK agriculture to net zero. The PFLA and our farmers are actively involved in research to prove the benefits of this approach. An example of this is SIGSLIP, which stands for Sustainable, Economic and Ecological Grazing Systems. It's a three-year project that started in January 2018, and it's due to end about now, so keep an eye out for the report once it comes out. Moving on to E, which is Managing Land or Water to Prevent, Reduce or Protect from Environmental Hazards, and J, which is Protecting or Improving the Quality of Soil. At the PFLA, we can see how this ties in really closely with each other. Responsible grazing can improve soil structure and porosity and increase soil organic matter. This increases the abilities of your soil to store water, so not, not only are your pastures more drought resilient, they can also reduce flood risks. They're also less susceptible to soil erosion, protecting the quality of your water courses and preserving your soil fertility. F is protecting or improving the health or welfare of livestock. Now, animal welfare is one of the highest priorities of the PFLA. We believe that animals are healthiest and happiest when spending as much of their lives as possible in diverse pastures, just like nature intends. In fact, Compassion and World Farming Organization list Pasture for Life as the highest tier certification for sheep and beef. G is conserving native livestock and native equines. Now, not all, but many of our farmers run heritage or native breeds of sheep or cattle on their farms. This isn't mandatory, but these breeds are hardy and thrive off of a 100% forage diet. So many farmers have found that they're much better adapted for low input pasture fed systems than some more modern commercial breeds that were bred to get to weight quickly off of grain. Now, these are just some of the examples and it's fair to assume that other benefits of well-managed grazing will also feature in elms, such as the benefits to biodiversity through creating habitats and food sources for invertebrates, small mammals and ground nesting bird species. The PFLA, along with Sustain, Soil Association, Landworks Alliance and OFNG presented a policy paper to DEFRA on why whole farm systems such as organic, pasture for life and agroforestry systems should be built into elms. Whole farm systems think about their impact on the planet holistically and in all aspects of the business, not just in one or terms of one or two variables. This means they have multiple and interacting benefits to the environment. Now, you obviously don't need to be in the PFLA to manage your grassland for the environment, but we are a community that is designed around farmers learning from and supporting other farmers, so no one feels like they have to reinvent the wheel. We also have a research group that keeps us up to date with the latest research surrounding pasture-fed methods. We're in the process of setting up regional groups for the PFLA now, so once circumstances permit, we'd love to see you at some of the events, workshops, trainings and discussion groups in the Southwest group. So look us up on pastureforlife.org or on social media and think about becoming a member. Now closing us out, we've got Claire Parnell. She's a farmer and agri-food specialist. She's also the rural lead for the CLOS LEP. That's Cormel and Isles of Scilly Local Enterprise Partnership. So thank you, first of all, for the speakers today. Um, there's been so much information, it's been really interesting. What um, stands out for me is the amount of activity that is happening in, the, in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly in this area and the amount of collaboration between different organisations, which is great because that hasn't always been the case. We have tended to look at issues in silos, so environment on one side, farming and farm productivity separately, and then our food and drink industry, tourism, um, diversification separate again. We have six ELMS tests and trials in Cornwall um, and we are one of five pilot areas in England for the ELMS Nature Recovery Network. For a county of our size, that is quite amazing. We also have the Lagas mapping that the University of Exeter has done and the Land Hub website proposal that Becky has been telling us about, and the Future Farm Project at Stoke Climsland. So a lot of activity um, and a lot of organisations working together to try and find solutions to some of the issues we face. We have the Local Enterprise Partnership, the Local Nature Partnership, the AONB, excuse me, looking at my list here, there's so many, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, the Cornwall Council's Environment Team, University of Exeter, Agritech Cornwall, Rothamsted Research right on our doorstep, West Country Rivers Trust, Farm Cornwall, the Rural Business School, and lots of other partners as well. So really between us, we are well placed to meet some of the issues that we face. And there are several issues. There is the state of nature, 
and the way we need to change our farming practice practices and our land management practices. We need to sequester more carbon into our soils. And there are a range of ish ways we can do that, either through planting trees or through better grassland management and rotational grazing. We can solve um, some of the flooding issues by management of our land to, uh, for flood protection. Um, we can prevent um, runoff, pollution, um, with 80% of our land farmed, farmers are definitely have to be part of the solution to these areas. Farming faces low levels of profitability in many sectors. We have Brexit, um, leaving the common agricultural policy and losing the basic payment scheme, which in the long run might be good things, but at the moment are worrying issues for us as farmers. We have low levels of productivity um, and we have issues facing us with um, trade, new deals. What effect will that have on the price of food and the price of our agricultural products with different imports and exports? Two things stand out for me as crucial. One is that as farmers, we need to be producing food um, and that food um, we have a great ability to produce it with a lower carbon footprint than we have in the past. And certainly we are already producing it in many cases to a far lower carbon footprint than many of the countries we're importing from. So in terms of providing food for our communities, um, either for eating in the home or in restaurants for our visitors and our um, residents, and also in hospitals and schools. We are the solution. We can provide that food in a low carbon um, way and obviously with um, low food miles. So that has to be a key thing. Secondly, our farms and our farm businesses need to be profitable and viable if we are going to be able to provide the public goods that um, government and our communities want us to do and be paid for doing so. If our farm businesses are not viable, we will not be in a position to provide those public goods and improve the biodiversity and the land management in our counties. Looking at um, environmental land management and the opportunities that Elms is going to offer us, I as a farmer won't make my decisions on what schemes I go into in isolation. I'll be looking at my whole farm business. So say I want to take 10 acres out of production and put into tree planting. Um, I won't just look at that scheme and the, the margin I can get off that. I'll look at what effect that's having on my um, main farm enterprises, my food producing enterprises. Um, will it um, increase the fixed costs on my remaining land because they'll be covered over less land now? Um, will it change my labour requirement? Um, will it change the productivity? Will I have to sell some sheep? Will I have to sell some dairy cows? How do I adjust all those things? Then I need to look at the productivity and the viability of my key enterprises, my main farm enterprises. Can I improve them by um, understanding my cost of production better, by um, becoming more productive, using technology better, farming in a more business-like way, or should I in fact change altogether and move into something entirely different? Should I diversify? Do I have a succession plan? Do I have someone who's going to take on from me? And if not, should I bring in some youngster in a, in a share farming agreement um, to help me to bring in those new ideas? And as I get older, help me with the physical side of things. Um, I will take a whole farm approach to all my decision making. And I think that is absolutely crucial to understand. And based on this, these ideas, the Local Nature Partnership and the Local Enterprise Partnership are speaking to DEFRA to see if we can pilot um, a farm advisory service that will help farmers with that whole farm decision-making process. 
Now, that wouldn't be one advisor with knowledge in all those sectors. Um, it would be a range of advisors, most of them already here on the ground and being used. But having a service that can brings those all together, so they work together to develop a whole farm plan, business plan for a farmer or land manager. So it gives him a direction of travel moving forward um, into the future and really begins to bring all those issues together. So fingers crossed, that is something we are working on. So um, in terms of um, where we go from here in this conference, I would urge you all to join the um, interactive workshop that the AOMB will be running on the 4th of um, March, which will give you an opportunity to have your voices heard. And I think it's very important that we hear everybody's views and we really have a, a real um, good consultation discussion about the issues and find a long-term solution to that. Um, we as farmers um, are definitely part of the solution but we do need to change, things need to change and we have around us all the opportunity to do that and here in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly and I do feel that the Isles of Scilly need to be an integral part of this process. It is crazy in my view to separate Cornwall from the Isles of Scilly in this decision making. Um, we have this collaboration, we have the resources, we have great organisations, great advice around us, great examples of what work and the climate. Um, we're already doing a lot of this so let's work together and really come up with a long-term solution um, that helps us as farmers, our environment, our biodiversity and our communities. So thank you very much and thank you for coming to the conference. Although there are still some unanswered questions, particularly for ELM, all of these organisations will be looking to give you as much support and information in the move from countryside stewardship and more on nature recovery as they can. If you have any comments now, please do put them below. Or if you've got any questions for Cornwall AONB, go onto Twitter. There's an interactive workshop, as we said, taking place on the 4th of March. And if you haven't signed up to this already, the link to register is in the description to this video or on the Cornwall AONB website. It's a Zoom webinar hosted by the team at the local Nature Recovery Pilot and Natural England. Now there's just one thing left to do and that's to call the raffle prizes. First up, we've got farm advice from FWAG Southwest, including a visit and follow-up report. And the winner of that is Philip Cadner. A case of Camel Valley wine goes to Oliver Baines. An MA Griggs voucher worth £25 goes to Wesley Pascoe and a Firebrand Brewery mixed case goes to Lucy Wilson Richards. Congratulations to all of you. Someone will be in touch to make sure you get your prizes. That's it from all of us here today. Thank you very much for watching.